about to have a conversation with Deja, who is a young, talented developer, and we are having some conversations about what can be done with emerging technologies such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, neural networks, speech, speech recognition <coughs> technology, etc. Well, uh, Deja and his team actually put those different technologies to work at a 24-hour hackathon that was held on the Microsoft campus, and they emerged victorious with the best high school hack because there were people up to ages of, was it 26? Up to ages of 26, and so these young men won the title, 15 years old, and I'll let him speak. His group's not here, but he's a representative of his group. And this app is also available on the App Store. Yes on the App Store, but we'll just talk about it right now. So Deja, if you can just tell the folks about, um, just a little bit about your background, who you are, how long you've been coding, how you learn the code, what kind of coding you do, etc. Okay, so I'm Deja Jackson, I've been coding. Speak up a little bit, please. Um, I've been coding since around sixth grade. Um, I first started in middle school by just uh, reading a book about iOS programming, and um, I've been programming ever since. So no actual formal training? No, no okay. formal training. Mainly through books and also through YouTube as well. So you basically put in the hard work yourself and you're self-taught, more yes. or less. Okay, yes. excellent. So fast forward to today, you've been coding for a number of years and now you're on a team of three talented people who won two hackathons, one which was an international hackathon and the latest one was um, held at the Microsoft campus uh, for 24 hours. Can you talk about the app that came out of that victory, what you guys created? Um, so the app that my team made is called Identify, and it's essentially an app that uses artificial intelligence for object recognition. Um, it was an app that we made where you basically point your device at something, uh, you tap the screen or you use a voice command, and it will tell you and your phone will tell you what that object is. The main reason why we had wanted to make it was for um, blind people or visually impaired individuals who would not be able to see whatever was in front of them. And we had looked at other apps of this kind that were already on the market, but they generally were very slow or did not work very well. So we wanted to create something that was easy to use and was also very fast provided and very Experience. Um, Interesting. So it was it was a disruptive element involved. Yes, that, that was part of it. Okay. And so basically, we used a neural network that was already made by Google, and we implemented it into our iOS app. As within 24 hours, we of course would not be able to train our own neural network, but. This network provided by Google was already able to recognize thousands of different objects. And so we basically took that and actually implemented it into a native iOS app. Um, so it was pre-trained. And the greatest thing is that this neural network does not require an internet connection. So for those who may need the most, those who may be visually impaired, who may be in a rural area, or somewhere else that does not have an internet connection, they can still use this service. Um, now, now, sorry, not to interrupt you, Deja, but this is something important, and I think a lot of people listening, or who will see this rebroadcast, will be curious. Um, first of all, the fact that you did it for people who are visually impaired, or permanently um, without sight, it's a very large population where typically they're not served by applications and things that emerge, so that's already commendable. But in addition to that, the fact that the application can operate offline, that creates a whole different set of opportunities for people who quite frankly don't have access to the internet all the time or Wi-Fi. So can you explain how is it possible that you can allow that to work offline? And I believe someone asked you during the hackathon, how did that conversation go? So we basically were, uh, while we were working on the app, um, someone who had, he was around um, 17 or 18 years old. He had previously worked with artificial intelligence. And so um, 
he came to our team and wanted to see what we were doing. And, so an uh, old man of 18. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, someone of older age. Um, All right. And so he basically was asking us about um, exactly what server we're using for our artificial intelligence, and we said that we weren't using one. It's everything is run completely on device. And the thing is, is that while well, training a neural network requires a huge amount of computing power, um, all of this object recognition is run completely on device. This is mainly because we have the training data that we have for this neural network preloaded onto a device. So mm, essentially the device is not exactly it's not getting content from a server, but rather it's actually searching um, files that are within the system. And the greatest thing about this is that while the, there are many of these and there are thousands of images with thousands of objects for us to recognize, the neural network is still able to run uh, fast enough that it can do a recognition within a few seconds Amazing. without requiring an internet connection. And so because of that, if we retrain the network to recognize more objects, um, we can simply add those new files onto the device and it can still maintain its offline functionality. Mm. So is there an element of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning involved in that process? Uh, yes, that's essentially the backbone of our app is where um, this neural network that is able to recognize objects, the way that it's able to do that is because it's been shown thousands of images of the same thing. It's essentially like an infant when they're learning something new. They have to recognize patterns within certain things uh, for them to learn. And that's the case for a neural network. You have to show it, you have to constantly show it images of the exact same thing. And eventually it will get better at recognizing those patterns and will be able to associate these patterns with specific things. That's pretty amazing. One of the things for me is I'll be launching a radio show pretty soon. And I've had some conversations with different people. And um, basically the conversations have gone that you got um, great thinkers um, who are talking about ideas such as big data, predictive analytics, people like Kirk Bourne, for example, incredibly brilliant uh, person, uh, astrophysicist, lead uh, data scientist at Booz Allen Hamilton, um, but very accessible. He's, uh, he's in social media and uh, I've, I've had conversations with him and uh, he's number one in terms of the rating of um, the brightest minds in, in big data. He is number one far and away. Uh, but what ends up happening is people of his stature talk about these concepts in an abstract way to the rest of us because we're not, most of us aren't. I'm certainly not a PhD or an astrophysicist. So what ends up happening is that it doesn't trickle down. When I was at Microsoft, they would talk about announcements that were made by high-level people as fireworks because we'd have people in the C-suite make an announcement and it would be a big explosion, but then it would just dissipate and it never made it to us. So the whole idea of my radio show is to get bright minds like Kirk Bourne and people of that type and to have conversations around neural networks, deep learning, uh, fintech, blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, of course, predictive analytics, and talk about it in a rubber meets the road sort of way about what can practically be done with these. So it brings me to what you've done here. I've actually seen people, experts, talk about the fact that AI is in the future and will we will arrive one day and will be will we be able to do anything with it? So you and your comra comrades, there are three of you, and what's the name of your team? Uh, we are named the Three Presbyteries. Very it's nice. Kind of, uh, so it's kind of based on the name of your school. Somewhat, it's a play on that? Uh, not, not, not really, per se. Um, it's mainly just... Oh, wait, wait, no, sorry, sorry. No, I see what it's a play on. It's a play on just the common uh, vernacular. Uh, and uh, and and then musketeer. So okay, I get it. Now, what's the name of your app? It's called Identify. Identify. Now, the thing about this is, these three 15-year-olds have basically 
made me a true believer and everyone who was a judge at the uh, hackathon because they won the, the grand prize that they could start from a blank piece of paper and 24 hours later, 24 hours later have a working application that was running on an, on an iPhone. So if they can do that, three 15-year-olds can do that in, in 24 hours, I imagine there's a few developers out there who could do some really great things. In my opinion, the biggest hindrance is the fact that we have people in the C-suite who are afraid of the technology, haven't embraced the technology, or people who are vying for standards so that they can have proprietary sort of ownership, and that's keeping uh, keeping uh, innovation from happening. So, in any event, back to to Deja and the and the uh, the app that they created. So, <laughs> excuse me, the idea that you could do this offline and have an offline component really opens up many different possibilities. What what made you come up with that idea? Did you go in and you and your team go in with the idea that hey let's do this where it can run offline or is that something you just stumbled upon? How'd that process work? Um, well it essentially was something that we had just happened to come across because, just um, that was just the way that the neural network that we were using, the, that was the way that it was designed. Mm -hmm. And so um, we saw that and we thought that, well, it just so happens that it doesn't actually need an internet connection for this to function. Mm -hmm. um, and so it mainly was a functionality that just came with what we had, mm -hmm. but um, it's still something, it's one of the main um, things that we use to make the app stand out is the fact that it has that offline functionality. And that's interesting because you and I had a discussion earlier and we talked about, uh, and I wrote a post on uh, LinkedIn where I felt like the way around the stifling, for lack of a better word, of innovation is by using a lot of the emerging technologies such as open source, APIs, um, the, the access, the democratization of storage and also compute power and infrastructure, so AWS, leading light in that, in that area. And uh, also with funding, now they have Title III crowdfunding where someone can actually take an idea and instead of going IPO, they can crowdsource, which wasn't available until very recently with the, with the passage of uh, legislation during the Obama administration. So what that does is empower people to really go around the structure that kept them on the sidelines. So you have something to say about open source and how that you feel like that makes an impact there. So talk a little bit about that. What do you think open source allows uh, people to do and how does that help innovators? Um, so I think open source is a uh, great avenue to foster innovation because it allows for people to modify any technology that they have uh, completely by themselves. They, if they're able to modify something to their own needs, they don't have to worry about going through regulation from some large company um, or any other body that may have originally um, expressed proprietary control um, over what they were doing. And it also means that it can create a greater sense of community among developers because that means that people are actually able to share their ideas with each other. Um, and generally, the technology industry is shrouded in so much confidentiality, it allows for greater collaboration between other developers and gives more people access to certain technologies because not every developer will be able to build their own, let's say, mapping application themselves. They'll need an API for that. And APIs are great, but open source APIs are even better because then they can be modified for other platforms um, or they can be available for other use cases. Mm -hmm. And I know we talked about, uh, for example, Uber when they came to be uh, people will focus on the app, the Uber app, and it really is a company that sort of grew out of an app in, in some ways, but there were three components of it uh, for navigation, for payment, and another component I can't recall right now that 
rather than develop that in-house, spend money on R&D and delay the launching of the company while they worked out the bugs and things on that, they used APIs and so they tapped into like Google Maps for navigation and another uh, API for the payment system and a third API for another thing I can't recall, but it cut down on maybe years of development and who knows how much investment in terms of getting those apps to work correct or those components to work correctly in-house. Well, those companies were already best of breed. And that's something that, again, like with open source, you've got a company, you've got an idea. There's a neural network that already exists, for example, with, uh, with Google. There's an API that you can use for your company to get best of breed technology without spending the money and, uh, and the time to develop. So put together between open source API and some of the things you get with uh, AWS from compute power, just raw compute power and storage, what does that mean to you as an entrepreneur, as a young person? How does that change the game for you and say your, your team? Well, I mean, the greatest thing about getting access to compute power like that, uh, for example, services like um, Amazon Web Services and Apple's Cloud Kit service, it really opens up more opportunities for developers that are generally younger, do not exactly have um, a great source of income. It essentially means that for a very low or almost free price, they can access this technology and so they're able to, and so it means that any idea they can come up with, they can actually build because they don't have the barrier of applying for access to a technology and then waiting for regulation from another company. Mm. They can instead just go directly through one of these lower price services or even create their own server and set these things up themselves um, and they're able to access these solutions. Mm. So it effectively lowers the, the the barrier for entry, that's a, a term that um, is used quite a bit in business schools and something that companies had relied upon for years where the barrier of in for entry was set so high because of the, the amount of investment that was needed in order to enter into a certain field was so high that they effectively had a moat built around their company and effectively had a monopoly where this is a direct challenge. And so we talk about disruptive technology and this is what disruptive technology is. And I think for all the CXOs out there, be you a CIO, a CEO, or director, or anyone with a VP on your card, you should be very careful about how you look at emerging technologies and be very careful how much you hesitate because people like Deja and his team, and what your team again is called? Uh, it's called the Three Brusketeers. The, th the Three Brusketeers? Um, Brusketeers. Brusketeers? Yes. Okay, the Three Brusketeers. Quite frankly, they're capable of taking market share from you very quickly. Before you know it, you will be, hmm, and also ran. And if you don't believe me, think about Uber, who owns no taxis, and is now the number one transportation company, I guess, and all the disruption they've done. I mean, never mind the fact that they're not, you know, they've had some stumbles in terms of the way they've run their company, but in terms of the technology, it happened so quickly, the taxi industry blinked and market share was gone. Think about Airbnb, the number one sort of residential stay, however you want to term it, they own no property whatsoever. And for a company I worked for, I managed both of those companies and uh, who have, you know, the, the industry blinked and there they were and market share was completely gone. And there are others we can go on and on, but that's the new model and uh, Deja and people like him and his team with these new emerging technologies, all they need to do is be pointed toward a target and they are like a heat seeking missile and they will destroy whatever is in front of them and they have the ability to do that from their living room with a, with a laptop and their ability to code and I'll end this I'll end this before I'm going to end with you Dave so you can tell us about where we can reach you where we can find your app but when I was doing uh, my MBA I did an MBA in, in Europe in France and um, 
I remember we were getting a presentation by one of the, the professors who was a professional. And he, he, was a, he worked for Microsoft, and he was an HR director of some global director at uh, Microsoft. And he talked about how they realized that the game had changed and how they had to do things differently with employees. But he said he, he remembers someone talking to him and saying, you have to manage your company differently when all of your value can get in the elevator, ride the elevator down to their car, get in their car, and drive away and never come back. What they realized is that all the value for their company was in gray matter, in the ideas of their company, and that those people can go elsewhere and they can be mobile. And it's a lot more so the case today than it was then when I graduated. And, uh, and I had also, just another kind of a side note to that, I had mentioned how Bill Gates was the first billionaire, in America at least, who made a billion dollars or became a billionaire with his with what he did being linked to ideas rather than tangible things. You know, Hunt, it was silver. Uh, Rockefeller was oil. You know, Getty, DuPont, um, Carnegie with shipping, etc. But for Bill Gates, it was ideas. And that changes the game. So, leave you with that, but I want to just uh, finish with um, turn it over to Deja. Now, tell me again your, your app that you guys created in that 24 hours that uses all this incredible technology. Tell me what it's called again. Um, it is called Identify, but um, the first letter of the I in Identify, it's actually replaced with the word I. So, E-Y-E. -E. Yes. So, if you can spell it out. Um, so, it's E-Y-E um, D-E-N T-I-F-Y. So the very cool Silicon Valley play on words. Instead of the letter I, it's the word I spelled out. Very cool. And it really kind of speaks to who you created the app for. Uh, kind of tip of the hat there. But also, where can they find it? People who are curious and want to know, well, how does this app work? Where can they find this app? Um, so this app is on the App Store. Um, again, I've um, already stated the name, but it's for... Um, as of right now, it's only optimized for the iPhone, but hopefully um, I, we will be able to optimize it for the iPad soon. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you search the name, you can find it on the App Store there. Excellent. And, and by the way, uh, I can be found on Twitter at StevJack4. That's S-T-E-V-J-A-C-K-4. StevJack4. And I will be sending out the link uh, to that app on the App Store. And this is just a sort of a test run of the first of many tech talks that I'm going to be having in noisy Starbucks like the one I'm having now with uh, thought leaders who are close to the ground. And we'll be having some, some talks with thought leaders who are, you know, sort of um, on more on the research side, the people, the brains behind uh, a lot of these things. But the way that we'll be talking about it is going to be in very, very practical terms. So. Be sure to tune in, and we're going to be broadcasting these live. We're going to be doing podcasts. I'm going to have an, um, a radio program, and that's what the subject will be. So anyone out there who's interesting and is a tech sort of, I don't know, uh, guru or uh, leading light, thought leader, we'd love to hear from you. And um, I've got someone lined up uh, that's going to be coming on who's a great guest. He works for a global company. And uh, he's been CEO at several tech companies, and we're going to be speaking about this very subject. We're going to be tackling the subject of blockchain, and um, that's one that uh, is really emerging and very, very important. And fintech is, is right in there. I guess fintech is the umbrella. Blockchain is something that's very, very important these days. So we'll be covering that. So uh, before we go, Deja, can you tell the people where they can find you on social media? Um, sure. Um, my Twitter handle and um it's not exactly associated with my name, but you can find me um, at uh, Pixel Games Dev. Um, okay. That is my current Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. um, you can also go on my website as well, um, DejaJackson.me, okay. and find me there as well. And Instagram, Facebook, um, LinkedIn. We'll, we'll we'll get that all out. I'm gonna actually send that out for everyone who's on as a guest. We're gonna send that information out. So I'll be sending that out on my Twitter account, and you'll be able to follow Deja and watch his development as he uh, emerges as one of the thought leaders. He and his team, they're 
they're working on something really exciting right now that you'll be hearing about probably in the next six months or so. So with that, Deja, I appreciate your insight and your thought leadership. It's been very enlightening for a lot of people. So any last words for aspiring developers, particularly the young folks out here, the millennials and the Gen X, your Gen, your Gen Z. I, I believe so. Yeah, the Gen Z folks. Any any uh, advice for them? Well, the main thing for me is just that the um, technology industry and specifically programming for making an app, any idea they can come up with, um, any idea 